Good morning and welcome to Welcome to Best Practices for Force Measurement. Uh, this is Common Measurement Errors and Challenges on CMC Uncertainty for Force Measurements. What is best practice? Best measurement practice is talking to the customer and replicating via calibration how the equipment is being used. We will go over this in much more detail during this meeting. Some important basics to start. I'm hoping you become a customer of ours if you are not already. Uh, we are very passionate about making good measurements, so I'll be giving you every bit of information I can and telling you everything I can during this time. There's a lot involved in creating the best calibration lab, so there's no way for me to complete all the ins and outs of every step. But I will tell you stuff that is near impossible to find elsewhere. And there's a quick note. This information will help you regardless if you are already a customer or not. Uh, at the end of today's webinar, I will have some absolutely incredible credible bonuses if you sign up for our new Morehouse Force Measurement Insider, and I will tell existing customers how to get these bonuses as well, so please stick around. Some of the bonuses, free reviews of calibration certificates from other Force calibration suppliers, our calibration guarantee, uh, that involves if you have an instrument, uh, send us the instrument in, send us the certificate with the instrumentation, we will calibrate the instrument send you back our calibration certificate, go over things one by one, make sure you are happy with the results. If you are not happy with the results, there would be no charge. Exclusive access to educational content and custom spreadsheets, free merchandise, customized training. If you have, uh, if you have a larger uh, group, uh, you want more one-on-one -on -one interaction, um, with you know several people in your organization you can schedule a webinar we're happy to give any of our webinar or training contents to to your group and answer individual questions your group may have uh, and we have exclusive offers on force calibrating equipment all of these and more will be explained at the end of today's webinar my name is Henry Zumbrun, I'm president of Morehouse Instrument Company. I've been president since I've been in Morehouse since 1999 and president since 2015. Um, there's my information. Uh, please feel free to email me with any any questions. A little bit about us. Uh, we manufacture force calibration products. We calibrate force measuring equipment using standards with very low uncertainties. These standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent to us for calibration. We help labs make better measurements. That's what we do. That is our passion. Uh, we would like to help you make better measurements. So I have some questions for you. We're going to go over best measurement practice, uh, but here's some questions to think about. Are you confident that your equipment is calibrated properly? Is your force calibration provider following the proper standards? Do you have a set of adapters and are you sending those adapters to your force calibration provider for calibration? We're going to go over that. We're going to go over the differences we see in our lab between customer sent adapters and when they do not send adapters. So we're here for about 45, 50 minutes um, and we're going to cover the following. Uh, common force measurement errors and the importance of calibrating the instrument in the manner it is being used and examples of CMCs for four scopes and shortcuts labs take to put you at risk. Let's go over why this is important. So ISO 17025 section 5.4.1, the laboratory shall use the appropriate methods and procedures for all tests and or calibrations within a scope. Why is this important? The calibration must be performed using an acceptable and agreed upon calibration method or procedure. This is the contract review phase. This is where you get lots of questions. Uh, some of them may seem bothersome, but they're very important and the, calib the lab performing the calibration needs to know how you are using the equipment in order to replicate. Uh, what could go wrong? So. The reference laboratory may only check the calibration procedure and not mention the adapters used to perform the calibration. Uh, even the ASTME 74 standard does not address measurement errors associated with the use of different calibration fixtures. This is a significant source of error and variability between labs that adhere to the ASTME 74 13A or other standards. So one of the things that can go wrong, uh, one lab calibrates it with a ball on top, another lab with a flat pad, you get an error of 0.2% and you're fighting on why is it? Is it the labs? Is it a, a fault with the instrument and the adapter or is it a fault with the actual uh, 
process. So we we'll go over that in a little more detail. But first, okay, so you're going to send your equipment out. Uh, this has been a headache, a uh, company called Oops. Um, they've been a headache recently. They've been damaging things. So just a quick review. You're going to pay money to have things sent out for calibration or you're going to have customers send them in. It's very, very important to have the shipping and receiving, the packing done properly. Here's some examples. On the left is a custom foam case, uh, Storm or Pelican. We typically use Storm case. Cases, uh, foam, high density foams cut. Chances are instruments going to be safe uh, with the recommended method right here. Uh, we've seen we've seen these get caught up on and uh, on uh, the uh, assembly, the conveyor belts, and they look like they've been sanded a little bit. But uh, besides that, we've most of the time, uh, almost 100% of the time, we've, we've received the instruments in good working order. The good then uh, would be to double box here. Double boxing is preferred uh, if you do not have the Pelican case. Put foam around it, that's good. The bad, uh, this one people think are, is pretty safe. It's custom blown foam, but the problem is that that load cell or test instrument is around uh, 30 or 40 pounds and it's it's going to break through this foam and eventually it's going to nick at the cable. We see lots of cable repairs. And then here's ugly. Um, this is just, just, it's just a travesty. This is something that uh, was done by Oops. Um, something fell off a skid and they rewrapped it. Uh, they actually lost the box. So it's just, it's just poor. Um, in any case, uh, if the instrument is damaged during shipment, problems such as lost calibration history, unrepairable scenarios, extra cost to repair, and claims may not be paid. Uh, recently, it's it's been a struggle to get any claims paid, so we, we take extra effort here on our end, but the people shipping stuff into us, our customers are not taking the extra effort, so there, there is an increased risk there. Um, so we're going to get on with that, uh, and we're going to start with the importance of adapters. Uh, the keeping the line of force pure, free from eccentric forces, is the key to the calibration of load cells. ASTM E74 does not address the various adapter types, but ISO 376 done, does. So when we say free, highlighting a line here, I mean, we want to keep that force vector as straight as possible um, where the highlight is. So keeping that, applying everything, uh, keeping that that line of force pure is going to yield much better calibration results. And then there's certain adapters that help keep that line of force pure. These adapters are uh, referenced in ISO 376 2011. Uh, it recognizes the importance of adapters in reproducibility conditions of the measurement. Proper adapter use in accordance with ISO 376 Annex A helps ensure the reliability of reported measurements. I have to note this, uh, Annex A is not a requirement for labs to adhere to, it's a recommendation. So, but A, A4.1, what does that say in the Annex? It says loading fittings should be designed in such a way that the line of force application is not distorted. As a rule, tensile force transducers should be fitted with two ball nuts, two ball cups, and if necessary, with two intermediate rings, while compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compressive pads. So we're going to look at this. Um, we have quick change adapters. These are ones that comply with ISO 376. Uh, there's a radius in here, a uh, spherical radius in this piece that I'm highlighting here in here. Um, and there's quick change are in line with lean principles and lean setup. So you buy one set of tension members and then you just adapt down to various adapters. And more on that, here's pictures. Here's a setup. Uh, over here is a, a load cell to the right is a load cell setup with those adapters. And then these adapters are also good with the sphericals. You can buy clevises, uh, pins, and everything else to do traction dynamometers, tension links, other things. Um, so really good. Uh, the sphericals help keep that line of force pure. And with that pure line of force, we're going to have more stress uh, and a better typically more stress and a better transfer. So competence and measurement error. What is competency and what are some examples of it? Well, using proper adapters when calibrating for instruments, that's an example of competency. Improper adapters can produce errors 10 to 20 times that of manufacturer stated accuracy. Proper alignment of the UUT, that's unit under test, adapters and proper methods for loading threads. Misalignment, different hardness of adapters, thread loading versus shoulder loading, 
this one's important uh, as far as there's a bottom thread loading. Some, some calibration out providers use the load through the bottom threads and others load flat against the base. There is an error. It's just, it's very repeatable. It's worth noting what your lab is doing if you're watching this. Uh, so contribute to a decrease in the repeatability of measurement results resulting in additional measurement error. So all, all those things um, can increase your measurement error. And then repeatability and reproducibility tests as well as proficiency tests are good methods for detecting measurement errors. Yeah, if you do a PT, um, we have a sheet that we'll get to. If you do a PT, uh, it can help you calculate your EN ratios. Are you within what, what you should be? Uh, these, are, these are some good tests. So the first thing we're going to look at is tension links, improper versus proper pin diameter. So picture on the left, fully engaged. Uh, this is like a 50 ton link. The, the, the pin size should be about 1.97 inches, which is 50 millimeters. That's what's recommended from, from Dylan. With the proper pin diameter, we're reading on the right about 50,000 pounds. Then, then we load without the proper pin then we load without the proper pin diameter, um, you know, different different engagement, much smaller pin, and we read 49,140 pounds. So if you compare these, just the, the simplest thing of switching the pin size um, from a 1.97 inch pin to a smaller pin, there's a difference of 860 pounds or a 1.72% error at 50,000 from not using the proper size load pins. Uh, very much this is an out of tolerance versus an intolerance and unless you know about this you could be making measurements um, assuming that you have a 0.1% error when you don't. Uh, my note here is tension links of this design seem, all tension links of this design seem to exhibit similar problems. If you are unsure, test. So good measurement practice for tension links. Using correct size pins is critical. This is from Dylan. Um, a manufacturer of tension links. If links are damaged, highly used or worn, decrease the time between recalibrations. The same size and style of shackle and pin used during operation should be used during calibration. And maintaining pin orientation is best practice. Misalignment on an S-beam cell. So picture on the left here, everything's aligned in our machine. I had to draw a little blue line in there to show you it's, it's, it's very critical um, alignment. And we recorded the output. And then the picture on the right, you can tell if you follow that blue line, it's just slightly misaligned. And we record the output when, you know, 10,000 pounds is applied in both these cases. Slightly misaligned, the output has changed by 0.752%. What does this do to the uncertainty? When we start talking expanded uncertainty, we start talking CMCs, what does this do? So... On the left, if we certify something from Morehouse, uh, it comes out, we report an error, we calculate the expanded uncertainty. Uh, usually this is AS, we do use ASTM E74 method to do this. Expanded uncertainty to the customer goes out at just under 10 pounds, 9.95 pounds. So if that customer then slightly misaligns the instrument on something that they're testing, uh, and you saw there wasn't that much, uh, slightly misaligned it. The expanded uncertainty jumps to 85 pounds. So 0.752% error, an increase of about 8.5, uh, 8.5 times uh, what, what you think you may be doing. And there's more example of what, what's that do if we look at each, each per point, um, this equation and how it goes. It's the worst that misalignment is going to be the worst at capacity and throughout the range you can you can see it goes from 1.782 the whole way to 86.6. If we look at another cell, if we look at uh, one of our cells, uh, I am biased here, uh, we look at one of our cells, uh, the shear web type cells, these are compensated for side load sensitivity and uh, if we look at these, here's this, a cell, we misaligned it and when we misaligned this cell, uh, purposely, there was 0.0022%. So tech goes out, misaligns the Morehouse shear web a little bit. They're going to have an increase in error, but it's not going to be uh, an uncertainty, but it's not going to be that much. It's only 0.0022%. So you have a cell that's normally 0.44 some percent, it goes to 0.527. Here's another situation. Uh, people don't think about it. When we talked about customers sending in adapters, that includes top, 
and bottom adapters. So if you're using that, that load cell that you have and you're using with a throwaway pad or some type of top adapter, it should, it should accompany the cell for calibration. We had a customer send in a million pound load cell. Uh, we performed the calibration. I, I personally did the calibration. The output was 1,500 pounds higher than the previous calibration for force applied of a million pounds. I did not know what was wrong. This is very uncharacteristic looking at all the data and all the history of the cell. Very, very uncharacteristic. So I said, you know, is this a stability issue? Has the cell gone bad? Or, or is it an adapter issue? So we looked at it more, uh, called the customer, uh, called the customer and they told us that, hey, we switched top locks about six months ago. Um, and we sent you the new top block. Told them what was happening. Uh, we both agreed. They said, hey, we're going to send you that original top block. We don't want the 1,500 pound shift. Um, and when we tested the original top block, the resulted in an output of about 180 pounds higher than it was uh, two years two years previous. Not a bad change. A 180 pound change on a million pound cell is is very low uh, on a two-year calibration. So it's with what expected. But when we figured out that what, what that was doing, what the customer for that those six months that they were using that adapter, um, they were thinking they had an expanded uncertainty of about 269 pounds with the original adapter. That would have increased when they changed adapters to 1,490 pounds using the newly fabricated adapter. So for those six months, all their measurements, their their uncertainty, uh, you know, it was it was five six times higher than uh, what they thought it was. So another. Another scenario, so we looked at top locks. What about loading through different thread depths? Uh, again, this is one that I got to play with, so I'm happy. This was a 10,000 pound load cell, uh, Sensatec load cell. Output was, and they set up the, the, the device directory. Output was 10,001.5 with one and a half inch of engagement versus 9942.3 with a half inch of engagement. Uh, the difference of 59.2 pounds on a 10,000 pound cell. So basically what we did, we took, I'm using the highlighter here, you can see, this one is the smaller adapter. We, you know, put that in the cell, bottomed it out, loaded it, put the, put the, put the larger one in, bottomed it out, loaded it, called the customer, told them what we were seeing. They said, hey, use, use one of your adapters. We got them on the contract review. They told us, use one of your, your adapters. They did not want to purchase an adapter or send theirs. And they said, we'll have one fabricated that matches the same thread depth when, when we get the cell back. So we used the inch and a half adapter uh, that engaged more of the uh, load cell. We used it, reported it on the certificate. But if they were just changing top adapters in and out, they could have that rather large error of 0.5%. So on a device that was expected to be better than 0.25%. So how are your devices being calibrated? Do you know? Multi-column load cells. Uh, here's an error associated with installing a non-flat base on a multi-column cell. This is an actual test. We reserved as another one that I did in our lab. It's a 300K cell. Uh, there's the base right here. If you if you see it uh, highlighting that uh, that area, so there was the base we did originally, and then it rotated the cell 0, 120, and 240 degrees, and recorded the output. Uh, that's essentially what we did. So with a non-flat base, and it was not flat, you could tell there were there were some issues. With a non-flat base, the, that those deviations in rotation were about 342 pounds, or 0.114 percent uh, error. So what we did, we cleaned everything up. We we took this this pad off. Um, we stoned the bottom base, made it as flat as possible, and redid the test. When the tests were redone, the error, um, maximum error in rotation dropped to 68 pounds, and then, and then that equated to about a 0.023%, which typically for ASTM type calibrations, people want better than 025. This one met it, and it was just as simple as making the base flat. I said earlier about some calibration laboratories do this, and it's true because you send a cell into them, they have an automated machine, they can do tension and compression just really, really quickly. Um, so they're going to do like a 10-minute cal, exercise it, boom, 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 they're going to do it, tension, compression, and it's fine. Um, but when they do this, they normally load through the bottom thread. Uh, when it's sent to our lab, we're doing, you know, 
primarily using dead weight, so we're, we're doing separate setups for tension and compression, and the majority of people we talk to want it loaded flat against the, the load cell space. So this test is, is just that. It's a difference. So what is the difference between loading through the threads and loading through the base? And will you see this difference? Most people aren't going to see it. Um, as you can see, the error is only three pounds at 25,000, three pound difference at uh, 25,000. That equates to about 0.012%. So if we look at that, um, you can see it's a very linear difference in output, and I can repeat this. You can do this test on almost any cell, and you're going to repeat. It's, it, this is one of those errors on a shear web cell that we can quantify all the time. It's about 0.012% um, is the difference. So if you don't know or your calibration provider is loading through the bottom threads and you want to add that additional error and you're loading flat, you can most likely use 0.01 or 0.012%. Batteries. This one was an inter in interesting uh, test case. Uh, we had a device that was received. It came in with customer supplied batteries. We tested it. Uh, at capacity, the air was 500 pounds. With their old batteries, we didn't, we didn't do anything. We said, let's, do, let's run a test. Let's put new batteries in there. Um, so we put new batteries in the cell, uh, and we retested it. And with new batteries, it was plus 200. Uh, well, plus 200 is well within spec. Uh, spec was 0.1% uh, of full scale, 250 pounds, two, plus one, 200 is within that spec. But if you look at this, what's interesting is the customer was using those old batteries. We did it with new batteries. So the, really their difference was 700 pounds. So that's 0.28%. That's almost three times higher. Uh, than the accuracy specification by the manufacturer. Something to be aware of, we've adopted a new policy to just change out the batteries of anything that comes in for calibration so that the instrument going back to the customer that they can replicate those results. That's a bit about proper fixtures. The conclusion, communication with the customer is key to address these issues. Unfortunately, this does not always happen. Examples of this scenario are as follows. Third-party suppliers, purchasing departments, management who does not care, larger companies where it is difficult to reach a technician using the device. To minimize these errors, the ideal solution would be to calibrate the device with the customer's adapters or have the customer send the appropriate adapters to the reference lab for calibration. Yeah, we've all dealt with this. Sometimes you try to do a contract review and you get a third-party supplier that doesn't want to does does not want to give you who the end customer is. So then it's then it, then you're left with hey, report what you did so they can repeat it. Uh, purchasing department sometimes it's hard to get through. They just said please calibrate. So you have to sort this out. You have to in these situations you have to let the the end user know what you've done. The best way to do that is put a statement on the certificate. Measurement errors. Uh, the ones in red are the ones that we kind of covered today. Um, we have a two-day hands-on um, force course taught by me and uh, uh, our dear friend, Dilip Shaw. He's one of the authors of the Metrology Handbook. Uh, he teaches a lot of measurement uncertainty. And between the two of us, I think we offer a very, very good class, and we cover these additional topics here. Um, and we cover the ones that are in red in a lot more detail. Uh, misalignment is covered. Several more examples. Uh, thread depth on column load cells. Um, not following published standards. We do a lot of that. Uh, different excitation voltages, what that does. Just using the appropriate adapters. More on adapters. I keep saying adapters, adapters, adapters. Well, that seems to be one of the larger error sources. And then appropriate exercise cycle, dual range calibration, thread depth. A lot of different stuff. So. We're talking about uh, best measurement practices. So we dealt with a lot of the physical components here. And now we're going to go to the scopes and what labs are doing or what we know labs are actually doing that, that may be good and may be bad. Um, but the point is, buyer beware here. Not all scopes of accreditation are realistic. Some people in metrology engineers have coined the ter term scope wars. You know, they say scope wars. Everybody wants to be better than the next guy. So they look to get get things by auditors and make their lab stand out uh, when, when compared because people shop on it. You know, the lower the CMC, the better it is for you as the consumer. Um, you'll, you incur that 
CMC to your measurement. Um, so the lower the better. Um, we're going to deal with some, uh, some scope examples that are realistic, some unrealistic, and common violations of standards including E74 and ISO 170025 on scopes. So let's look at this. Uh, of course, this is biased because it is our, our scope. I think it is realistic. Things are called out. There's a formula here. There's a nice formula that says, hey, our, our, if we're not using dead weight, uh, our uncertainties are 10.7 through 21.8. If we're using dead weight, you can look over here, various machines, um, we're at 0016 is the best we can do. It really varies, 0016 to 002, uh, 16 to 20 parts per million. If we're at the low end of uh, 0.1 to 10 pounds, we're at 0025. And if we're really low, hand weights, handling, uh, some different things. We're at 003 or 30 parts per million. But we, we, we make mention here. We say forces can be applied incremental and decrementally through 120,000 pounds, thus permitting the determination of hysteresis. Of course, dead weights, we can go up and down. But on transfer standards, same thing. For us to do this, to, to you send in a load cell and you want hysteresis, for us to do this, we need to have our standards calibrated, and we have our standards calibrated by NIST. Uh, it's an extra $10,000 plus bill just to get that to be able to, to do hysteresis. Do you think other labs are having their standards calibrated, ascending and descending? Uh, are they paying the extra fee to do it in order to certify your equipment? I don't know. Um, but what I do know is a lot of scopes aren't telling you what they can do. On this scope, we can do ASTM E74, and we can assign a class A loading range. Over here, on the dead weight side, we can assign either a class A or double A. That's important. Um, so we calibrate your load cell to ASTM, assign a class A loading range. You can only go out and do E4 calibration. You can't come back and do more E74 and assign another class A. And we'll go over some of those later. Um, but anyway, this, this mentions, you know, and here, if you want to send something in that's above $2 million, we didn't pay NIST an extra $30,000 on those on all of those load cells to do decreasing measurements. So uh, million pounds to $2.25 million um, were, were increasing only. If you wanted hysteresis, it would have to be a million pounds and, and under with us. So more examples. Uh, this is a common scope. Uh, CMC looks believable. Uh, the issue is a percent uh, for the CMC for load cells It's difficult to quantify. Are they taking the worst case and have they calculated CMC correctly? All, these are always questions we answer, we, we want to ask. Um, you know, 035, it's believable. Uh, it's believable if they went to, if they used a good calibration um, supplier. Then we get into unrealistic. Uh, this is part of a 15-page scope. Um, they say they have a 500 pound load cell that has a measurement uncertainty of 1.7 grams or 7.5 parts per million. This is it's just, this just silly. We're at 16, they're claiming 7 at k equals 2, and this 2 is, is using primary deadweight standards published um, 4 parts per million for their standard uncertainty. Um, th that even puts NIST at 8. Uh, so this is just is just silly. Uh, whatever auditor, and it's a load cell. Um, it's not even it's not even dead weights. So a load cell is better than basically this load cell is better than NIST. Just shame shouldn't happen. But again, it's buyer beware. Look at the scopes. If they're unbelievable, guess what? They're probably not a lab you want to use for calibration. So calculating four CMCs. Looked at some scopes. How do labs do it? Well, it's all over the place. Um, some auditors will, or some consultants will go out and they'll just say, hey, go use uh, the uh, National Research Center in Canada. Go use their template. Others will say, hey, NCSLI RP12. So others can say, go use the ASTM E74 appendix. Um, but, you know, what we do, uh, we use the ASCME 74 appendix combined with A2LA R205. I think it's a very good compromise. It may be conservative, uh, but being conservative is not always a bad thing. So, and currently, if, if you're, you know, looking at things, we are currently developing a guidance document and plan on having future webinars on how to calculate for CMCs. That document has to make its rounds. It will probably be out in 2018. A preliminary draft is written and at A2LA. 
So for CMCs for ASD and E74 calibrations, uh, if you're going to do one, you're going to need the calibration report for the device, the uncertainty of the instruments that were used to perform the calibration, calibration history, manufacturer specification, error sources if known, uh, end user then is going to have to conduct the repeatability study. It's required. R&R between technicians uh, just to help you know your process. And you're going to have to now complete uh, proficiency testing requirements. If anybody is interested in more detail, we wrote a paper. It's been published in CalLab. It's been published in NASA. It's available on our website. Uh, you can request a PDF. You can re, you know, email me. I am happy to give you the link, happy to share that, that paper with you. But basically, we wrote a paper, and the summation of it is, if you look at it, the best we think anybody is going to be able to achieve um, for labs, you have, have calibration by dead weight, and then when another lab performs that calibration uh, after that lab is 031% at a 20% test point. So um, those labs that, that are claiming, you know, using secondary standards that are, that are claiming lower uncertainties of like uh, lower than 01, um, very questionable uh, unless they're unless they're going to NIST and using the best standards in the world um, it's very very questionable so this we have a sheet um, so we have a sheet that has tabs on it that guide you through uh, what you need to, to comply with a CMC it, it does use ASTM E74 and it does use um, a 2 ar 205 it has a section where you can say hey non ASTM E74 and, and drop down and put in like non-linearity. Um, but for the most part, this, this, this sheet is made for the E74 um, and A2LA R205, uh, and, and it includes everything. Reference standard stability, reference lab uncertainty per point, temperature effect, environmental effects, repeatability of the unit under test. It gives you things. There's a tabs there to do uh, R&Rs. Um, it is available for download. It is free. Uh, if you want to check it out, I recommend you go, go to our website and uh, go to support tools. So, buyer beware, not all labs follow published standards. Shocker, right? Um, we're going to go over some published standards and show examples of labs not following these standards. Uh, of course, this one's easy. Best practice, guess what? It's best practice is to follow the standards. Pretty easy. So, the way ASTM works um, is pretty much they're still on TAR, uh, test accuracy ratio, where primary standards need to be known within 005%, 50 parts per million. Then you calibrate secondary standards with primaries, and you can assign a class AA lo a loading range. So basically, the next, the next standard, uh, the first point in that AA loading range is 05, so 10 to 1. And then we go to 0.25, so 10 to 1, 5 to 1. But here's what's important. Those secondary standards with a class AA range can only assign a class A loading range. Class A devices that are then used to calibrate the testing machine to ASTM E4, they cannot assign another loading range. And there are lots of laboratories out there that blindly just keep perpetuating, hey, I got a, I got a class A loading range, I'm going to assign another class A loading range. Well, it breaks the system. So here's the do not. Do not assign a class AA loading range unless you are calibrating with primary standards accurate to better than 005%. Do not assign a class A loading range unless you are calibrating the device using a secondary standard that was calibrated directly by primary standards. Note, a force measuring instrument with a class A loading range cannot assign a class A loading range. This is what we see violated all of the time. It is very frequent. So, and a force measuring instrument with a class AA loading range cannot assign a class AA loading range. That's not how the standard works. Labs do it. If you have a cert with a class AA loading range on it, you better have the reference standard listed as primary standards. So, here's an example of ASTM not being followed. So, remember, we said that class AA loading range, if you want to assign a class AA loading range, you have to have your standard used to perform the calibration has to be used primary standards. Um, and then you assign a lower limit factor. That's 2.4 times the standard deviation. Um, so in, in general, let's look at this. Class A 
AA loading range was assigned on that certificate and their standard that they used was an interface gold load cell. This is not dead weight. It is not good or it is not allowable. So if you have a cert from this laboratory, you are not in compliance with ASTM E74. Pretty simple. Let's go on. This is just this is a typical, we see certs like this all the time. Um, then they go on and they say the ASTM uncertainty represents the expanded uncertainty. No, it doesn't. It's a lie. It's nowhere near the expanded uncertainty. Uh, this is why, for those familiar with ASTM, this is why o, in ASTM 06 they used to call uh, the lower limit factor uncertainty. Everybody was confusing things, so they changed. As the committee changed, the E28 committee changed, and when it is now the lower limit factor. It is one of several components that make up the expanded uncertainty. So then we go on this. The expanded uncertainty is less than the reference standard uncertainty. That's another another faux pas. Uh, when, you, when you're accredited, you cannot assign a customer uncertainty that is less than your uncertainty, and this lab does that as well. So just bad examples the whole way through of what's going on. And here's another one. Here's not following the standard. Um, some calibration providers here, over here, some calibration providers claim zero can be used as the first calibrated test point. They argue this with auditors, and it's not the case. If we look at ASTM section 8.6, it says the loading range shall not include forces outside the range of forces applied during calibration. Okay, great. So then they say this zero point is my first point. Okay, let's look at 7.2.1. This, this gets, you cannot have zero as a first test point. In no case should the smallest force applied be below the lower limit of the instrument as defined by the values 400 times the resolution. So zero cannot be a first test point. It needs to be 400 times the resolution is the lowest first force point. Um, in this example, the resolution is 0.1 pound. So at 0.1 pound times 400, they would need to do a 40 pound point, not zero. And then they go and they say, hey, your class A lower limit is 192.3. It's not, it's 500. That's the first non-zero test point. So this is wrong. Uh, 500 pounds is the right answer. We have a full webinar uh, on ASTM E74 explained if anybody's interested uh, to know more about that. So more do nots. Uh, do not assign a class A or AA loading range below the first non-zero force point. Several labs, there's an example of a certificate with, we've observed several labs that violate that rule. The right calibration provider. Here's another example of a certificate. This one's, this one's more fun. Um, if we, we examine these certs, people send us certs in, say, is this good or is this bad? Well, this one's bad. There's no mention of measurement uncertainty of the reference standard anywhere on the certificate. Uh, the person claims, the lab claims, direct traceability to NIST and not to SI. It's, that's minor, but if you're making measurements, it's traceable to SI through NIST if you're using NIST. Does not report uncertainty per point. Yeah, this would not be accredited. This would not fly in any means as an accredited cert. Uh, and then they do this one. This is, this is my favorite. Um, meets all published standards, but does not list any of them. So basically, you get this device, and it meets everything. You're good meets everything. And then there's questions on exercise cycles and that, that goes more on best measurement practice. What's, what's the proper amount of exercise cycles? Normally it's three um, to answer anybody that's there, three or four. So I have a question. Uh, you, you sat here, uh, hopefully you've made it through this long. Um, you're listening to this and you have a 10,000 pound device with an accuracy of 0.5% of full scale, plus or minus five pounds. My calibration certificate says the unit reads 10,004 when 10,000 pound was applied. Is my device in tolerance? There's readings, 5,000 pounds, there's a two pound error or measurement bias is two pounds. And at 10,000, there's a four pound error. Is my device in tolerance? Hopefully, you know the measurement uncertainty. Without knowing the measurement uncertainty, 
there's no way to know if the device is in tolerance. And if you do not know the measurement, and certainly you do not have a traceable measurement. So in this situation, the answer is no. Um, it could have been intolerance, um, but when we know everything, when we know the standard uncertainty, uh, we know the measured error, we can calculate the risk. Um, this is using method 5 of ANSI C540.3. Um, it's a method for guard banding and calculating PFA or uh, probability of false accept and risk. So using this method and graphing this, uh, this particular instrument, there's a 34.47% risk that uh, the device is not in tolerance. So, and the measurement risk area is here over, over to the left and to the right of the red lines. So, do you know if your calibration provider is passing instruments that should not be passed? This is a situation where if they're saying it's good, uh, it's not, uh, cause be, because the uncertainty is high. So if we look at that, uh, and we look at Morehouse versus a typical lab, and if we look at the same device, um, and we look at TURs, we look at everything else. If, if that device were sent to Morehouse for calibration, um, we would have an expanded expanded uncertainty of 0.22 pounds and a TUR of roughly 20, 22 to 1. Uh, we do have a course on measurement risk and it explains TUR. Explains TUR and everything else better. Um, if we look at our competitors, typically they're at 0.5% of applied. Their ex expanded uncertainty at 0.5 is about 5 pounds. They're running, depending on what we're doing, they'd be running a TUR of 1 to 1. If we look at this graphically, here's its graph. So if we make the measurement and it's 10,000 and it's 10,004 pounds, um, it's good. Uh, we can we can call it in intolerance, assuming the resolution is 0.1 pounds. Uh, there's some other things that you need need to go into that equation. Uh, whereas if if that goes somewhere else and they in somewhere else calls it 10,004, they cannot with a 34.4 percent risk, they cannot make that statement. They cannot pass the instrument. So what happens? When the measure value is changed to 10,004, most people think the device is still in tolerance. When we calibrate it, it is. When the lab with a CMC of 0.5% calibrates, the risk goes from 0% to 34.47. In fact, that lab with the 0.5% needs to adjust that instrument so it reads 10,000 pounds. If it reads 10,001, there will still be a risk higher than 4%. So just to let you know, uh, it's very important to run those calculations. So common issues with force calibration laboratories, uh, just a wrap up, uh, CMC values are unrealistic on some of those certs as you, as you have seen. Measurement re uncertainties reported to the end customer are less than the scope CMC. Uh, lack of understanding of the ASTM E74 standard. Not properly evaluating measurement risk or probability of false accept. These are all problems. Um, so conclusion, uh, when we talk about this and we do a wrap up, using the right calibration provider who has a measurement process uncertainty capable of meeting your needs and follows for published standards, very, very important. Making sure the calibration replicates how the instrument is being used. I'm hoping after today's webinar that everybody starts thinking about this in a lot more detail. Using the right adapters to ensure results are repeatable and having competent technicians. And that's not always enough. Uh, the right calibration provider is going to do go above and beyond. They're going to be do things. They're going to make the calls. They're going to they're going to have a good supplier record. Here's here's one of those examples where we have uh, quality and delivery of 100%. That's for for us. I like to brag here. Um, and accreditation is often not enough. Uh, our mission is to be regarded as the best independent force and torque calibration resource in the world by providing realistic solutions and continually develop new products to meet our customer needs. That's a lot to do, uh, and you struggle with it uh, quite a bit, but uh, we're always moving forward and we're always getting better. So we also like to defy the averages and meet 100% on quality delivery and overall customer satisfaction. Doesn't always happen, but we strive our best to do it. Um, and we take the appropriate actions and uh, use the appropriate uh, methods uh, to constantly better ourselves. So thank you, uh, everybody. Remember, there's a special offer coming up. Um, remember, one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. So next time you're in a meeting wasting everybody's time, uh, it may be better just to go have the measurement made. So 
Thank you. Remember, our next webinar uh, is on load cell troubleshooting tips. It's June 27th. This one will be available online as well after we give the webinar. Uh, if you're viewing this one on a recorded feed, uh, then you can go, and if you're interested, you can go and grab the uh, load cell troubleshooting. So. Remember, uh, I said uh, the bonus and more about the force measurement in insider. Well, here it is. Uh, here's the more detail. Free reviews of calibration certificates from other force calibration suppliers. If you have certificates and would like to send them to us, we are happy to review them. If you are working on your own certificates and want us to take a peek at them, several customers have taken us up with this offer, we will. We will gladly send you unbiased opinions. You may not like them, but they will make your certificate better. Uh, we will perform a calibration, send you the data, and you only pay if we meet your needs. That's if you have, uh, if you're unsure that we can do what you need us to do, um, give us a call. Uh, we're happy we're happy to do this. Uh, we want we want an established business relationship. We want you to be the right fit uh, for us and be happy with us. So it's a one-time thing. You send us your new or you have something we haven't done before and you're unsure of it. That offers on the table for one instrument. Uh, we have exclusive Excel templates. Currently, uh, if you sign up, we're giving, uh, you saw a lot of the measurement risk, the guard banding. We have a PFA calculator that we give out um, that allows you to put in all types of uh, criteria. Uh, and then you'll have, if you sign up, you have access to upcoming information, upcoming webinars and training, free merchandise via promotion and special contests. Uh, this is kind of fun when you have, have contests and people participate. Um, customized online training for your company in regards to force or torque calibration. Hey, you, you have something you want an hour webinar with, with several people in the company, happy to do it with questions. Open the mics up. Now they're muted. Open the mics up um, and just go back and forth, uh, explain things in more detail. Articles on force, torque, and measurement related topics to help you make better measurements. Exclusive offers on force calibration equipment and training. Yay. Time-saving tips using lean manufacturing techniques for the calibration lab. This one is important. Uh, stupid things, uh, and they're not really that dumb, but these tips here uh, can save lots of time and money, and the, the load cell webinar is one that we hope that uh, will save some people time and money when they are diagnosing uh, or troubleshooting things. Um, so if you're viewing this, uh, you're one step away from making these. Uh, there's a sign up. Just send us that email at hsumbrun at mhforce. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. At this point, I'm going to stop the recording and take questions. Thank you.